In the previous item, we have derived what we call the point mass equations of motion for two-dimensional symmetric flight. As you know, we would like to use these two equations to answer questions like how far can an aircraft fly with a given amount of fuel, how fast can an aircraft fly, how slow can an aircraft fly, what is the maximum altitude that can be achieved, or how steep can an aircraft climb. So, we basically have two equations with many unknowns, and that is typically something that cannot be solved, unfortunately. But, if you look closely at these two equations, there are actually three different types of variables. First being the time, t. Now we can call this an independent variable. During flight, all variables can change as a function of time, and the pilot does not have an influence on the time itself. It will keep on running no matter what we do. Next, there are two variables which we call state variables. Gamma, the flight path angle, and V, the airspeed vector. These variables describe the state of the aircraft, and it indicates basically in which direction the aircraft is flying. Now, these are the variables we would like to calculate if we try to answer questions like how steep can an aircraft climb. Finally, there are several other parameters like thrust, weight, the aerodynamic force, lift and drag, and the angle of attack of the thrust vector. These are all a consequence of the pilot control input, the state of the aircraft, and the atmospheric conditions. Now, if we can express variables like the aerodynamic force as a function of the state variables v and gamma, then the equations of motion become much simpler. You essentially remove a variable. So let's start with the aerodynamic force and try to express it as a function of speed. In the lectures on aerodynamics you've had previously, you learned that the aerodynamics of a wing can be expressed in the form of a single equation, the lift-drag polar. Now this equation tells us that the drag coefficient consists of two elements, a lift-independent part, zero lift drag, and a lift-dependent part, the induced drag. So even when there is no lift, there will be some drag, such as friction drag. This is essentially the same as when you are riding a bike. You do not generate aerodynamic lift, but you do experience aerodynamic drag. Now when a three-dimensional finite wing generates lift, something interesting appears, tip vortices. Due to the pressure difference between the upper part of the wing and the lower part of the wing, air will start to flow around the tips in a circular motion, creating wing tip vortices. So, when an aircraft flies past, it leaves tip vortices in the air. And you can imagine that these vortices contain kinetic energy. Now, this is essentially the cause of aerodynamic drag. In the two-dimensional case, no tip vortices are left behind, and thus there is no lift-induced drag. Now, let's have a look at the equation that relates lift to drag, the lift-drag polar. The parameter a in this equation, aspect ratio, describes how slender the wing is, as indicated by the figure. The larger it is, the more the wing approaches a two-dimensional wing. Now, the parameter phi in the equation is the span efficiency, a measure for the lift distribution over the wing. In the ideal case, when the designers have done an excellent job, it actually equals 1. Now, in the current lecture, we are not interested in merely the drag of a two-dimensional two wing, as indicated in this figure, uh, but in a complete aircraft. The wing by itself is in fact three-dimensional and therefore has lift-induced drag as represented in the figure now. All the other parts of the aircraft, such as the fuselage, antennas, vertical stabilizer, also create lift in drag, which we call parasite drag. For example, if the fuselage is placed at a zero angle with respect to the flow, it will have a certain amount of drag. Furthermore, this drag will change if we place the fuselage under an angle. In addition to this drag, it will also generate some lift. So if we all add all these effects to our lift drag polar, it will mainly shift to the right. In other words, we have more parasite drag for more or less the same lift. Now this curve you see over here still resembles a parabolic equation. We can clear see that clearly if we create a graph with, instead of CL, CL squared on the axis. Here you can see the lift drag polar of a real aircraft and the parabolic equation represented with a straight line. So basically we can still use the lift drag polar. However, now we use what we call the factor E, the Oswald efficiency factor named after 
W. Bailey Oswald. He was a famous aeronautical engineer already in 1932, working for the predecessor of NASA. Now this factor E is used instead of the wing efficiency factor phi if we describe a complete aircraft and not just merely a wing. In this case, the zero lift drag coefficient ZD0 is also larger than for the wing only case. In reality, a two-term drag polar is used in order to be a bit more accurate. So this accuracy is needed in the real world, world when a drag decrease of 1% is already very significant. Now that is pretty cool, isn't it? We have a very simple equation that completely describes the complex aerodynamics evolving around an aircraft. But let's go back to our original problem. We would like to describe the aerodynamic forces as a function of airspeed in order to simplify the equations of motion. So the lift drag polar does not give us forces, but coefficients. Okay, so we would like to express actually not the aerodynamics in terms of CL and CD, but in terms of actual forces, lift and drag, as a function of airspeed, in order to simplify the equations of motion. So let us start with lift. We have lift is equal to weight and if we write out this equation then we obtain Cl times a half rho V squared S is equal to the weight. So in other words we can also bring Cl to the left hand side of the equation and state that this should be equal to weight divided by s, 2 over rho, and 1 over v squared. Now, on the other hand, we also have drag. And let us express what the drag of an aircraft is, starting with the parabolic lift drag polar. So the, we have CD is CD0 plus K1 times CL plus K2 times CL squared. Now, this is only the drag coefficient and we should write it out in order to obtain the actual drag. So the actual drag is the drag coefficient CD0 plus K1 CL plus K2 CL squared multiplied with the dynamic pressure, half rho v squared, and the wing surface area of the aircraft. So, interestingly, we now have Cl over here in the equation, and the other factors, Cd0, K2, half rho and s are constant. And finally, we have airspeed, which is nice because we would like to have aerodynamic drag as a function of airspeed. So we have one simple problem. We have one equation with two unknowns, Cl and V. But as you see on the left hand side here, we can actually express Cl as a function of airspeed. So let us insert this whole equation in the drag equation. If we do that, we can state that drag is still CD0 plus K1 times CL, and that is weight over S, 2 over rho, and 1 over V squared, plus K2 times the same equation, 1 over v squared, this whole thing squared, and all of this has to be multiplied with a half rho v squared s. So, it's starting to become quite a long and lengthy equation, but let's just see what it looks like and try to interpret what it means. It basically means I have, if I take all the 
elements separately. I have drag is equal to CD0 times a half rho v squared s plus k1 times weight over s 2 over rho 1 over v squared multiplied with a half rho v squared s plus k2 times weight over s 2 over rho 1 over v squared squared times a half rho v squared s. So a long equation but we can actually remove some terms in the equation. Clearly we see a rho here and a rho there. We see a v squared there and a v squared there. A 2 and a 2 and an s and an s. So the only thing rem that remains of this part is k1 times w. On the other hand, we have this lengthy equation and you can actually see that over here we have v squared squared, which is essentially v to the power 4 and we also have a v squared over here. So let us write what we now have in a slightly more simplified form. We have drag cd0 half rho v squared s. We have k1 times w. And if I write out the final term, I will actually obtain k2 times weight squared from here. I am left with one wing surface area because I have one over here as well. I'm left with 2 divided by the air density and I'm left with 1 over v squared. And essentially I now have a part of zero lift drag and I basically also have lift induced drag on the right hand side. But now have a look at this equation a bit more carefully because if you look at all the terms CD0 is constant, half is constant, we're considering one air density, a specific altitude, S wing surface area is constant, we're considering one aircraft with a given weight, K2 is constant, this weight is constant, S is constant, still at a constant altitude. So essentially we have a function of v squared plus a function of 1 over v squared and this shows us how drag is related to airspeed. So one part of the aerodynamic drag as just derived actually decreases with increasing airspeed and one part of the drag increases with airspeed. Now if we would draw this for a specific aircraft with a specific weight it looks more or less as follows. So at low speed the drag mainly consists of induced drag and at high speeds it mainly consists of zero lift drag. And if you add both terms somewhere in between there is a point of minimum drag and that is quite interesting. So when we are flying at low airspeeds drag actually reduces when the plane increases speed. There are not many vehicles that actually show this behavior. From the picture we can also learn something in terms of aircraft design. An aircraft that flies very fast mainly has to deal with zero lift drag and this is why fighter aircraft have very thin and small wings. 
Aircraft that are supposed to fly very slowly, on the other hand, have wing wings with a very low wing loading and a large aspect ratio because they are mainly influenced by induced drag. Concluding, we have described now the aerodynamic drag as a function of airspeed and that under the assumption that lift equals to weight and this simplifies our equations of motion which we started with in this lecture. Now in the next lecture I will show you how propulsion and thrust can also be expressed in terms of airspeed, making the equations of motion much simpler.